Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you are tuning in. Welcome to Homesteading and Gardening in the Suburbs with Misfit Gardening. I'm Emma from Misfit Gardening and today we're going to be talking all about starting a seed bank. So stay tuned and find out more right after this. Welcome back. So I mentioned today that we are talking all about um, starting a seed bank. And, you know, I've kind of gotten into building a seed bank um, more so over the last couple of years. Um, and part of that is just because, um, you know, seed prices are going up um certainly some of the places that i've really enjoyed um getting seeds from they've they've started to go up in price and um because i grow organic and heirloom varieties of seeds um it can get quite expensive so um at the end of last year I challenged myself to only buy seeds once and the seeds that I bought were going to be um, my sole supply of food from the garden uh, for the next three years. So I went ahead and got lots and lots and lots of seeds. I mean, I probably dropped between $300 and $500 just on seeds crazy amounts of money um but then when you kind of look at it against you know spending you know three hundred dollars every month just on groceries you know it, it's you know it kind of pans out um it, it works out in the end um but what if i told you that seeds could actually be more valuable than money like worth far more than, you know, the money that you have in your bank account or stuffed under your mattress or hidden in a sock or wherever you keep um, your cash. Like, you'd probably think I was kind of going crazy. And, you know, I just want to say right off the bat, I am not a prepper. I'm not into prepping. I know that there is a big culture here in Utah where they do a lot of prepping. Um, but that's, that's just not me. Um, I'm kind of more like I have the skills, um, you know, to do things in lots of different scenarios and situations. Um, but I don't prep for it, right? Knowledge is, uh, more valuable to me than, um, actual stuff. Um, but I, I digress. Um, you, you know, a seed bank is, um, something that's, probably going to save you money going forwards after you've started it i mean obviously dropping you know 300 bucks on um you know seeds is a horrific expense um on the onset but you know if you are able to um maintain that seed bank moving forwards um it's actually going to save you cash in the long run and a seed bank really is an insurance policy, right? It's a way to um, store native and heirloom seeds for like fruits, vegetables, flowers, and herbs, and really to preserve them to use in later years. You know, you can grow them in case they become extinct, um, in case of climate changes, war, or catastrophic events happen which destroy your regular supply of seeds right and without seeds or our pollinating insects like bees we wouldn't have food you know our survival as a species ultimately depends on nature and working with it right not by controlling it and i know that's like quite a um you know, an emotive, um, you know, statement there that I've made. But, you know, really, if we don't preserve the plants um, that we enjoy growing, you know, we're going to be in a situation where we're not going to have that variety anymore. Um, and, you know, over the last decade or so, uh, even longer, actually, I mean, the varieties of fruits and vegetables that were available, you know, let's say in the early 1900s, you know, is 
so much less than what there is available now you know we have cultivated and maintained those plants that have got those attributes that we were looking for so whether it was for you know the biggest flowers or the most beautiful scent or the nicest taste you know the most unusual looking whatever those reasons were they're the ones that we've cultivated and it's really important now to try and save as many plant species as we can from going extinct. Um, you know, we're losing more and more plants, you know, animals, insects, everything really, um, due to, you know, a myriad of problems from, you know, um, pest disease, pollution, and, you know, human activities within them. So even you know the varieties of produce that we're eating is declining massively i mean you know e even just from country to country so i know when i would go into a grocery store in england you know there's very different types of apples that are available so for example like cooking apples in england are called bramley apples and they're big they're green they're tart and delicious a Granny Smith's apple is an eating apple in England, um, whereas it's a cooking apple here in the US. But in England, you know, you often have your Cox's apples, your Pippins, um, you know, you'll have Brayburns, Galas, Red Delicious, Golden Delicious, um, Fuji, Fiji, you know, there's just so many more varieties of apples. Whereas I go into a store um, here and there might be, you know, a Fuji apple, a Gala, a Red Delicious, a Golden Delicious and a Granny Smith's. Maybe there'll be a Honeycrisp or a Pink Lady, you know. But there's, there's just such a smaller variety of food that's coming through. And obviously, you know, varieties that are in grocery stores are usually there because, you know, they are standing up to shipping. And shipping produce or anything, you know, it, it takes a bit of a beating, especially if it's coming um, from abroad, which a lot of things do nowadays. Um, you know, you've got to factor in, you know, is it going to be able to handle the flight or the boat and the transport, um, you know, across the country, you know, on the roads in refrigeration or not in refrigeration. So, you know, the, the varieties are declining and that's one of the great things about um you know gardening is you're able to increase the different varieties of stuff that you're um gardening and um a few weeks ago um we watched the movie um seed the untold story and um actually one of my um close friends um actually tagged me in it i'd never heard of of the movie and she watched it and she's she's not a gardener at all but um it actually kind of motivated her to start one so you know she kind of reached out and um you know I've had a few friends recently, very recently, um, sort of all start gardens at the same time. So um, my husband and I chilled out and watched this movie. And, you know, it, it, there was a, a piece about cabbage. And I, I know that just sounds like, you know, not the vegetable that you would, you know, ever be, you know, kind of thinking is exciting. Um, but cabbage apparently used to have... 544 varieties available and now i mean there is maybe 10 maybe 20 at the very most of varieties available um i mean does does anybody else wonder what those lost varieties might have looked like or tasted like i mean i i did i like my husband paused the video and we were sat there on the couch looking at each other and we're like I wonder what they tasted like. Did the, you know, does all cabbage taste like cabbage? I mean, obviously you've got different types of cabbage. You've got ones that, you know, are very leafy. You've got the Savoy crinkly cabbages. You know, you've got kind of the pointed ones. But, I mean, what, what did they look like? You know, were they more prone to pests or disease like you know you just just don't know and you know that it's not just cabbage there was 
you know, lots of other examples of um, produce that has, um, you know, disappeared, basically. Um, I think they were saying it's 92% of the varieties of food um, or seeds that we have um, as produce have disappeared. And that's horrifying um, to me. And, you know, I love growing something different, something strange, something that looks unusual. Um, I love doing that. And that's, um, you know, kind of where I realized that what, um, you know, I do in the garden when I'm trialing um, plants and produce and I'm saving seed and building a seed bank. That's something that I can, you know, help with, um, you know, whether it's a, a local um, seed swap and being able to share those seeds that I do or whether, you know, I decide later on to set up, you know, a, a seed company or something like that. You know, the, these varieties that we're losing, you know, they might have been, you know, something that could, you know, withstand frosts better or, you know, they don't run to seed and, you know, taste bitter and disgusting in hot climates or, you know, there's just all these amazing attributes for things that we might not even know about. And, you know, unfortunately now we will never know because, you know, we've lost them for good. So as, as a gardener or a homesteader, it's really important for you to save the seed from edible plants um, and, and also from flowers and herbs and stuff that grow well in your garden. So, you know, ultimately you can be a guardian of those seed strains for the future. And, you know, it's also something that's really fun to be able to share, um, you know, the story of heirloom seeds, you know, that you or your family have saved you know, over the generations, there's um, another homesteading blogger who has saved like family, her family's bean seeds. And I think they've been in the family for like a hundred years. And that's, that's kind of cool, you know, to say, you know, this is this strain of bean, you know, we've had for so long. And, you know, I'm just looking at like a box of seeds that I've got to plant out. And, you know, I've been able to get seeds that I've absolutely loved from, um, you know, the UK and I'm, I'm looking at um, a runner bean and it's painted lady runner bean and it's one of my favorites. And, you know, this particular runner bean, I mean, not these actual seeds, but this variety of runner bean has been grown since nine, sorry, since 1596 in England. And the name was painted lady was apparently in reference to queen elizabeth the first who was always um heavily dolled up with uh blusher and white chalk on her face so they're i mean they're delicious to eat they're beautiful to look at and you know they've got a history and it's it's pretty cool um you know that they're able to grow here and you know all around the world and they've been growing for such a long time it's it's amazing to me so um globally there's like more than a thousand seed banks uh, around the world i mean the most famous is probably the salvbard um global seed vault that's in norway i think they call it like the doomsday seed vault and stuff and it's kind of half in ice and you know I, I mean i would be pretty nerding out if i was to go see it i mean just to see all those hundreds of thousands or millions of seeds that are in there you know um um, and people send um, seeds to seed banks for various reasons. So, um, you know, whether it is, you know, as a, a fail safe almost, um, you know, if something happens to the environment or, um, you know, we need to try and um, help an area out after disaster to be able to grow food um, you know and there's there's been cases of where like seed banks have been targeted or have been destroyed um, you know and now you know we've lost kind of seeds from those areas but you know we've learned by our mistakes now and um, usually seed banks will send um, portions of their seeds to another seed bank just in case something unexpected happens 
um, to the original. But I mean, seeds in global seed banks have been, you know, found in ancient tombs or early cave dwellers. Um, you know, they've come from far reaching explorers who've gathered samples on expeditions around the globe. And, you know, really the longevity or their, uh, the seeds ability to germinate um after being stored long term is really unknown we just we just don't know um so why should you start a seed bank well there's again there's a few reasons why why you might want to right so some seed banks actually um store seeds related to agricultural crops um and you know they they ultimately are the insurance policy against genetic loss in food varieties that are available to grow um other seed banks hold like rare species so like there's orchid seed banks so of all the different orchids that are found around the world um for example and you know other seed banks store things like for you know restocking populations or providing humanitarian aid um or you know actually for plant breeding research projects so a lot of kind of agricultural colleges will do plant breeding um you know investigations and ex like i don't want to use the word experiments um because that kind of conjures up ideas of gmo um and stuff but that's that's not what i mean you know they'll do kind of cross pollination studies um to help you know create um you know plants that have you know an ability to um you know handle you know different temperatures better or have a resistance to diseases like rust or blight um those those kind of things and that's that's what some um universities and colleges are working very hard to do um but having a personal seed bank really allows you to um you know save the seeds that you love you know those plants which adapt and grow really well in your garden or you know have those characteristics we talked about earlier like flavor you know or the nicest looking flowers or the biggest juiciest fruit you know um you know or you know what about the plants that survive you know problems that you have you know maybe you've got some great squashes which survive powdery mildew and vine borers or maybe you've got tomatoes that ripen in less than 50 days or you know whatever you've you've got in in your garden you know by building your own seed bank you're gonna really decide what plants you're saving the seed from and why so as, as an example i've got um basil that i grew last year that had really big leaves and it grew all the way through the season and in actual fact it took um the hard frost that came to really kill it normally um frost um you know the the minute the the temperature drops down basil's kind of toast but this this one kind of kept going so i saved those seeds because i knew that you know if i plant that one a bit later um you know it's more likely to be able to tolerate that frost more I also have tomatoes that I've saved from the garden. Tomato seeds are really easy um, to grow and I've saved like the tomatoes that we thought were the most tastiest. Um, I've saved corn seeds like glass gem corn and I've also saved my climbing burlotti beans because I cannot find those seeds anywhere else. I find ones that look very similar but they're bush beans and i really like climbing beans so that's something that i'm going to keep saving 
and growing out and saving the seed again and then maybe um, once I have enough of that that can be something that I can go ahead and share with people um, so you know there, there and there's lots of other things that I save you know I've saved my garlic cloves I've saved um, different salads that have performed really well I saved a lot of squashes because I love squashes so much um, but there's, there's lots of different things that I, I've saved um, for different reasons and you know being able to you know produce our own seed um, you know really does pay off in the end and um, you know this year I just harvested um, some carrot seed and I was incredibly excited about that because the last two years I have failed miserably at growing carrots um, you know the seedlings have just gotten too hot and have kind of shriveled up and and died because you know the the sun's just you know too high well this one carrot survived and as much as my husband wanted to pick it I wouldn't let him because I wanted to save the seed for the very reason that this one didn't die and you know genetically it's got something there that is gonna you know pass on to its um, offspring in the seeds that make it it's probably going to be more likely to grow um, because you know it's able to tolerate that heat um, and the the drought so for sure I was saving those seeds um, so that's um, what I've started to do and now in my gardens as I'm trying to um, you know plumb the space and the plants that are going in there I am always leaving a plant usually at the end of the row so you know I still do plant in kind of rows or you know in squares in, in you know in the box and the ones at the outside unless it's the only one that survives um, but typically the ones at the outside are on the end of the row are the ones that I will leave in place to save the seed from later so there's a few things that you need if you are going to get started on building your own seed bank it took a while to to get to this bit um but i wanted you guys to understand kind of why it was important and to talk a bit about you know what the seed bank is and why we need one um so to start building your own seed bank you obviously need some seeds and um, something to put them in so whether that's kind of you know mylar pouches or seed paper envelopes um, little resealable plastic bags glass jars anything like that works great and then a container to put them in now um, I used to store all my seeds in um, a biscuit tin in a or a cookie tin um, I now have too many seeds to store in a biscuit tin um, so I actually have a large plastic tote that I use to store them in for the moment um, until I can get hold of something better um, we've actually got some ammunition boxes um, that I've kind of got my eye on um, that are my husband's currently full of ammunition um but, but um you know um, i might be persuading him to um get a better set of ammo boxes so i can use those for um the seeds so let's just talk a bit about the seeds um so really you need to have um a variety of seed in your seed bank right not just from you know different vegetables or herbs fruit flowers or whatever but different varieties of those particular um you know vegetable type or fruit type or herb type so let's take um squash as an example so you'd want more than one different variety of squash let's let's take zucchini right um if you're saving or trying to build your seed bank you don't just want to necessarily rely on just one type of zucchini so let's say that you you know gold rush zucchini right that's the yellow one 
and that one is you know really awesome for you and you grow that year after year after year well you might want to consider another variety let's say black beauty zucchini which is the dark green one um to have as a backup just in case you know something goes wrong and you can't grow that one one year or that one doesn't grow you know you've got another um zucchini that you can try and um you know there's I mean, I have multiple varieties of plants anyway, just because I really like the diversity and I like my family to try something new. Um, but I ultimately store three different types of seed in the seed bank, okay? So I store heirloom, open pollinated, and um, hybrid seeds. I also save guard like seed from my garden now. Hybrid seeds do not mean GMO or genetically modified seeds. I'm talking about F1 varieties. So I've got a couple of seeds and it's really only a couple. It's actually um, a variety of onions that I have been trialing because I've been desperate to grow onions here, but I've been quite unsuccessful. So they were still produced organically, just really the difference for, um, you know, F1 hybrids against, um, you know, sort of heirloom seeds is F1 hybrids are made by pollinating two plants that have the traits that a gardener or farmer are looking for. And then what happens is you cross pollinate these two varieties and they produce offspring in their seeds that exhibit both of the traits. And that's like you know we're shortened version of what plant breeding is so seeds that you save from hybrid f1 plants are not the same as the hybrids that grew so um you know it, it I like to use the analogy of of you know dogs right so if you have a border collie and a newfoundland and you were to breed those two together your resulting puppies if you were to you know like breed them again you're not going to get the same you know as what you had previously you're going to have um you know different um traits that are going to pop up in that next generation of um you know puppies or you know in our case seeds so um heirloom um seeds are open pollinated and um you know that means by insect or wind um but heirlooms are only allowed to breed with other heirlooms of the same so you know let's go back to the the border collie um you know you've got a border collie and a border collie and they're gonna make border collies and heirloom plants you know let's say i've got you know um a gold rush zucchini and another gold rush zucchini they're going to pollinate between the two and i'm going to get gold rush zucchini so that's kind of a very quick um overview on that so an heirloom seeds are historical varieties and typically you know they've been saved for at least 50 years um and the seeds always true to type and you know they um the plant breeders and farmer seed farmers who are producing this are very careful and take you know great lengths to try and prevent cross-pollination so you know when you purchase that seed of i don't know a hubbard squash and you're planting that you're not going to end up with like some weird spaghetti squash you know cross that's happened right so you know these these growers do go to some amazing lengths to you know be able to maintain those historical varieties and as i mentioned i save seed from my own garden and typically if you're saving seed from your garden it's going to be open pollinated and actually it's likely to have crossed with other similar plants growing in your neighborhood so um brassicas for example are renowned for 
cross pollinating with each other so if you've got a broccoli and a cabbage and they've gone to flower they will cross between the two of them um same with kale um you know so that these th things um you know happen naturally and you know you've kind of created like a you know a, a little hybrid there and if you were to grow that seed out you know you may get some you know weird and wonderful broccoli cabbage um you know cross that's happened and it might be delicious it might be you know way better than you know the broccoli or the cabbage that you were growing for example um there's something that i've i've really wanted to try and i think they're called kaleettes and they're like a brussels sprout kale cross and the sprouts look like um little baby cabbages on on them um you know all kind of ruffly almost like flowers and i hate brussels sprouts um but maybe i would like those instead um so you know having things that have cross-pollinated isn't necessarily a bad thing um you know it's going to give you some diversity um in your garden that's happening naturally and you know it might have um you know some ability to survive pests or disease or you know your local climate um a lot better i've got um squashes and pumpkins that have come up um and lots of other volunteer plants i've got some tomatoes that have come from out of nowhere although i'm now starting starting to suspect they've come from um the dogs um we've been calling them tomatoes for a while i mean i'm sure they'll be fine um but that's the only thing i can think of as to why we have these random tomatoes that have popped up in other areas of the garden um but you know i i always advocate to you know leave the volunteers that have come in because more often than not they're growing earlier they come in a lot sooner than you know the traditional you know heirloom or open pollinated and even the hybrid um plants so um i i if you are going to be saving your hybrid f1 seeds you must save some other seeds um you know whether it's heirloom heritage or you know open pollinated seeds from your area you know you, you must have a backup for those because you know the and the reasons why I, I recommend saving you know both stuff that's from your local area hybrids f1 seeds and heirlooms is you know it gives a greater probability of being able to grow the plants right if you've got um a hybrid f1 that is more resistant to blight in your tomatoes yeah um you know you could grow those knowing that they are more likely to produce a harvest of tomatoes for you because they're you know they've been bred to be able to cope with blight a bit better you can also be growing some heirlooms as kind of a, a trial in another area to see whether they're going to grow for you you might find that there's an heirloom tomato that grows far better than your hybrids and you know you're able to keep growing that so that's one reason uh, my second reason is it gives a greater probability of getting a harvest so thereby being able to feed uh, your family your neighbors you know whatever you're trying to do right so you know if you're growing you know seed that you saved yourself and an heirloom and a hybrid f1 you are far more likely to be getting a harvest because you're growing different varieties you know maybe the hornworms and caterpillars only prefer you know um the heirloom that you're growing maybe they don't like the hybrid or maybe the you know one that you've saved out of your garden you know is able to grow four times better and produce way more um you know tomatoes on it my third reason is to encourage diversity in the growing area really the more that you grow in there the more diverse you're going to be getting um not just in your local um 
you know with the plantings that you have there but you're going to be attracting in different insects you're going to have you know more beneficial insects that are coming in and beneficial birds you know they're going to help um, manage any pests and you know the in some cases having um a diverse syst- like mini ecosystem that's being created um you know you can have a more of a self-sustaining garden you know there's going to be less work that you need to put into it um you know and you're going to be able to get more out of it and in some cases it can help like limit disease um and pests as well and my fourth reason is to have a backup in case of germination failure so let's say that you know some of your seeds got wet uh, or they weren't stored properly you know you've got a backup of some other varieties that you can still grow without having to go out and buy some more and if you're saving seed from the garden paper lunch bags work great um you can pop them over the plant allow the seeds to dry and then just shake them out into um that lunch bag you can store them in the lunch bag or you can transfer them into a seed envelope or a like lamina pouch um, and you can you know just write down what they are and when you collected them because I've forgotten to do that before and I've had seed in bags that I wasn't entirely sure what they were but you know we'll see when they grow right that's kind of half the fun um but if you've got seeds that you've purchased you can actually place a portion of those into an envelope or a pouch with you know the information about like the date when they were packed and um, that's usually on the seed packet and then go ahead and store them so how do you store them well i mentioned earlier that you you know you can use a metal container right like a biscuit tin or a cookie tin um you can pick those up from thrift stores charity shops you know and they work great because you know they really keep things like cool dark and dry and that's really what your seeds want to be they want to be cool dark and dry and um some people add desiccant packs or rice like dried rice um to help keep the moisture from spoiling seeds because ultimately it is moisture that is going to mess up um your uh, seed bank so try and keep things as dry as possible so if you've got like glass jars that have come from you know you cooking stuff in the kitchen you can definitely like clean those out and use them to store seeds um, there's various methods um, to doing it I've seen people that you know they dry some rice um, in the oven and then they put it in the jar and then allow it to cool and then they add packets of seeds and then they just stick the lid on and then pop them you know somewhere cool and dark um, other people have put them in freezers um, people have vacuum sealed them uh, and put them in the freezers you know, lots lots of different methods that you can um do i currently just have them I, you know i've not bothered with a desiccator because I, I live in such a dry climate at the moment anyway um if i i move to somewhere that's a bit more coastal um or has um more humidity then i would definitely consider um putting a desiccator in to help prolong the shelf life of those um seeds but right now i don't i just keep them in a plastic tote that is in the basement because it's pretty cold all, all year round in the basement once you've got your seeds in your seed bank you don't just want to leave them there and hope for the best um you know in a few years time you want to grow out some of the seed each year to be able to save more seed and to ensure that the seeds that you have are still being able to germinate so you can do a germination test you know or you can just sow them out in your garden um but always ensure to use the oldest seed that you've got stored and rotate through the varieties that you're growing and using and you know always use the oldest seed kind of like how you do with like you know canned goods in your pantry 
And the wonderful thing is when you've got a really well-established seed bank, you can share the seeds from your personal seed bank at a local seed swap or with organizations that are looking to store seeds. And you can share them with your friends and family and other gardeners to help really bring in that diversity into their garden too. And it helps them to be able to try some of those wonderful varieties that you've been storing. I mean, how great would it be that you know, you've got a strain of lettuce or, I don't know, whatever you're super passionate about, whether it's, you know, um, chili peppers or squashes or beans or, you know, even if it is a lettuce, you know, whatever that you've been storing. And let's say it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing variety. And every time you dish that bad boy up for dinner, everybody is in awe of how amazing this thing tastes. Well, how great would that be to be able to share that with other people so they can also, you know, enjoy that vegetable or fruit that you've been saving? Or maybe you've got some beautiful flowers and, you know, the most sweetly scented rose or geranium or whatever it is. You know, being able to share is, you know, a wonderful thing. And, you know, having somebody else enjoy um, that plant as well. So just to recap, um, when you're starting a seed bank, you need to ensure that you have a cool, dark and dry place to store your seeds in. Keep your seeds labelled with what it is, the variety and when you harvested it so you can ensure that you rotate through your seed bank and replenish the seed as it gets older. You can store seeds in foil pouches, paper envelopes, you can keep them in metal boxes, cans, tins, jars, whatever you got. Save the seed from your plants each year from your garden and save some heirloom varieties of seed too. Um, you can save hybrid F1 seeds that you've purchased, but you will not be able to save the seed grown um, from that plant and grow the same variety. So hybrid seeds are only good for that plant to grow in that one season. And if you save hybrid seed, you need to, like you, that you're purchasing, you need to save them in bulk, but you shouldn't rely on hybrid seeds for your seed bank. Um, instead, you should look to save open pollinated local varieties and heirlooms, okay, in your seed bank. Um, a diverse seed bank will allow you to grow food in years to come and help you to be self-reliant from the need to, you know, both purchase seeds um, and produce from the grocery store. So that's all from me. Um, thank you for sticking with me in this episode. I know it's it's a, been a long one, um, but I really appreciate it and uh, appreciate appreciate you guys tuning in. So until next time, I'm Emma from Misfit Gardening, and I hope you guys grow a beautiful garden. <laughs>